And welcome again, another reaction to Oversimplified. Uh, we've done the World War 2 Part 1 and 2. If you've not checked them out, I'll leave a link up there at some point during this reaction. Uh, we probably should have done this one first, mainly, would argue. But um, I don't know. We just kind of go on requests sometimes. And the World War 2 came first. So now we're going to World War 1. And we're putting Part 1 and Part 2 in the same episode, Kevin. That's it. So you'll be able to watch it right the way through. Yeah, so they're a bit shorter, these ones, so it's a bit easier. Mm. So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think we need to say much more, apart from the other one was a great watch. And we learned quite, you could learn quite mm. a lot from these, so yeah. they're good to, good to learn. Oh, it was. Very good. Oh, yeah. Fine. So, yeah, let's go for World War One Part 1. The world of 1914, a time of modern technology, culture, and fashion. Truly the height of civilization. <laughs> let's have a war. Everyone knew a big war was coming. France Did wanted I? some stuff back that Germany had taken from it. Germany wanted to take more of everyone's stuff. And they were building a big sexy navy that was making the British uncomfortable. <laughs> These two empires thought they were really cool, but lots of different people who lived there didn't think it was so cool. And some of them had even been declaring independence with help from Russia. Everyone was talking about each other behind each other's backs, throwing the fact that military technology had come a long way since the last major war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up. In this area of Austria-Hungary lived some Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand goes there for a nice drive in an open-top car yeah. with his car's route published in advance. And that went just about as well as you'd expect. <laughs> some assassins were waiting for him along the way and threw bombs at his car. But they missed and blew up some officers behind him instead. <laughs> so the Archduke goes into hiding, leaves Sarajevo, and the whole war never happens. Except no, the Archduke doesn't leave, but instead goes back out in the open top car to visit the injured officers in hospital. The driver takes a wrong turn and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside one of the failed assassins uh. who shoots him. Austria-Hungary is understandably mm. pissed about all this, and they think the Serbian government had something to do with it, which they might have. So they go to their ally Germany and say, Hey Germany, we're going to declare war on Serbia. And Germany is all for that. <laughs> so Austria-Hungary send a big list of impossible demands to Serbia. And when Serbia refuses, they declare war. Austria-Hungary and Germany are friends. And Serbia is protected by Russia, who's friends with France. So they all declare war on each other. Montenegro joins in too. France and Britain also have a kind of alliance. So when France says, <clears throat> Hey Britain, you got my back? Britain is like... <laughs> maybe <laughs> and then they decide to stay out of it which is great for Germany because Germany has a plan they know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to get ready for war so with this guy in charge Germany will send all its troops into France at lightning speed while Russia is getting ready defeat France then move all the troops to Russia and defeat Russia and then we all speak German and eat pfeffer potast every day <laughs> just one problem France has loads of forts and defenses along its German border and Germany can't waste any time fighting them, so Germany decides to go around them through Belgium. Oh! Belgium is neutral, but Germany wants to march 750,000 troops through it to get around France's defenses. Whoa. They're hoping Belgium will just kind of sit down and shut up, but they don't. They fight back, and they're pretty good too, so they slow the Germans down. What's worse is that Britain shows up, and they're pretty pissed that Germany's invading neutral countries. So now Britain declares war in Germany. So Germany push on through Belgium and commit some atrocities along the way. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniform. So if you're trying to not look like the bad guys, good job. Yeah. The Allies have a propaganda extravaganza, and this starts having an influence around the world, notably in America. The US President Woodrow Wilson sees himself as a bit of a Jesus figure <laughs> and spends most of the war trying to get everyone to just hug it out. <laughs> but there's also a large population of ethnic Germans living in the United States, and when the war first broke out, they were like, yay, Germany. But now that they're committing atrocities in Belgium, they're less enthusiastic. Hmm. Let's play Spot the French Soldier. <laughs> Did you see him? <laughs> Easy, right? He's wearing a bright blue uniform with red trousers. And do you know who else spotted him easily too? The Germans. So when the French were slowly marching in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily tore them to shreds with their <laughs> giant guns. Yeah, All the nations involved in this war went thinking of that. a war mentality. Yeah. And all of them had to update their uniforms and <laughs> tactics a lot during the Great yeah, for War. A red target. Because this war was going to be like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Russia's ready for war, and way earlier than expected. Hey, Austria-Hungary, can you get on top of that? 
Oh yeah, sure, we've got this. Nope. <laughs> so Germany has to send some troops back to the east to defend against the Russians. The chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army is this guy, and although he is handsome, he turns out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignores Germany's advice, and then comes running back to Germany whenever they get in trouble. Austria-Hungary even gets its ass kicked by tiny Serbia, who repels all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. It's better news for Germany in the north, though, where they almost completely wipe out the Russian second army. Back on the western front, the Germans continue advancing and are in sight of Paris. Wow. At this point, mm. anyone would be forgiven for thinking the Germans were going to get that quick victory after all. But then things start to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done, and he ordered his armies to stop retreating. In the resulting battle, a gap opened up in the German lines. If a gap opens up, the enemy can use it to flank you from the side and behind, so the German armies have to retreat. The Allies launch a counterattack, so the Germans dig into defensive positions. The Allies yeah, the trenches. <laughs> then both sides move north, trying to outflank each other along the way. When they reach the sea, they're in a stalemate with trench systems running the whole way from the coast to Switzerland. The beginning of trench warfare on the Western Front. Here's how trench warfare works. Two opposing lines of trenches with no That's line. Mindless, uh, One yeah. side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days at a time. This had a huge psychological effect on the soldiers, leaving many shell shocked. Then the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land. A muddy wet mass of shell craters and barbed wire. The defending trench would unleash machine gun fire on the attackers, inflicting thousands of casualties. The attackers would send wave after wave until either they gave up or the opposing trench was finally overrun. There would be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands in order to gain a few meters or kilometers Man, of land. That's wow, that's Living crazy. in the trenches was hard work too. Corpses, mud that could swallow you whole, mm. pools of poisonous water, rats, disease, the smell. It's insane that millions of soldiers put up with these conditions mm. and commanders ordered them to do so for years. <sighs> Yeah. Nothing nice about war. No. Um, yeah. Rather than talk about that, should we go straight into part two, Kev? Yeah, certainly. With both sides stuck in a hard stalemate, they knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory, but about simply wearing each other down. The Allies had plenty of men to expend from its overseas dominions. And the British also started a naval blockade, so Germany couldn't import stuff, like food. Neither side really wanted a long, grueling war, though, so they both thought of ways to break the deadlock on the Western Front. Idea number one, new frontiers. When the war first broke out, Australia was quick to take German New Guinea. The Allies also quickly jumped on Germany's colonies in Africa, and particularly in German East Africa, locals were enlisted as soldiers and carriers by both sides, leading to a tragic loss of life for the native Africans. Some new combatants entered the war as well. The Allies' new friends were Italy and Japan. Japan was busy building itself an empire, so it was more than happy to take away German islands and colonies in East Asia. Italy actually had an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but after some tense relations, and then the Allies promising to give them some of Austria-Hungary's stuff, they switched sides. Italy opened up a front in the mountains here, but like everyone else, they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. The Central Powers' new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. The Ottomans... Ottoman? The Ottoman were divided on whether to actually join the war or not, since they had been exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Some of the politicians who did want to join went off on their own and fired some shells at Russia, and then came back and said, whoops, looks like we're at war now. <laughs> the Ottoman entry into the war we was a particular laugh, concern really. for the British, since the Middle East was full of oil, and Britain wanted all of that oil. First, the Ottomans tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains, but they weren't prepared for the cold, and many of them froze to death. Then they crossed miles of desert to take the Suez Canal from the British, but that failed too. Then the Allies tried to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench warfare campaign, but that also failed. The Ottomans blamed their initial losses on the ethnic Armenians living within Ottoman territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million people. Then the Germans sent spies into Afghanistan to try to convince the Arab tribes there to rise up in jihad against the British and attack India. But that plan failed, partly because the spies got bored, brewed their own alcohol, and got drunk, which is a bad thing to do in Afghanistan. All these new frontiers hadn't done much to change the war. Aware that the Allies had more men and supplies than them, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Before the war, there was a big conference that set out the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, no killing civilians, Basically, don't be jerks. The Germans held a meeting and decided to Let's be jerks. jerks. Yeah. Zeppelin air raids commenced over British cities. They also started attacking the Allied trenches with chlorine gas, and they used submarines to sink civilian ships. 
One such civilian ship was the Lusitania, which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk, Ooh. further swaying U.S. opinion against the Germans. Not to be completely unfair to the Germans, the Allies also engaged in chemical warfare soon after, and they had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which let the Germans justify their attacks. Meanwhile, Austria-Hungary still hadn't dealt with Serbia, so the Central Powers enlisted some help. Bulgaria wished it was bigger and was still bitter about losing the Second Balkan War. The Central Powers promised to make all of Bulgaria's wildest dreams come true if they helped, so they signed on, and together they knocked out Serbia. The Serbian troops retreated through Albania, which was neutral but had some ties to Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary entered Albania in a friendly invasion to chase down the Serbians. <laughs> friendly invasion. It's 1916, and a lot is happening. As if they didn't have enough enemies already, Germany added one more to the list. <laughs> Portugal had been getting a bit chummy with the Allies behind the scenes, and Germany didn't like that one bit. Around the same time, the only sea battle of the war happened. Both sides had a new powerful class of battleships called dreadnoughts, but they were so expensive to build that neither side wanted to risk losing them in a battle. So they kept them in port, except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got damaged, so they didn't try that again. The UK started conscripting men to the army, so they had plenty of reserves, which is just as well because the Western Front was about to get brutal. The longest and one of the bloodiest battles of the war started when the Germans launched an attack around the French city of Verdun. The French defended it desperately, leading to hundreds of thousands of casualties. Under pressure, the French called on its allies to do something to draw the Germans' attention away. So the British started their own long and brutal fight, the Battle of the Somme, with 60,000 uh, British casualties on just the first day. <sighs> It was also here that the British first used one crazy brand new piece of sci-fi technology. <laughs> the Russians had been getting pushed back further and further into their own territory. But in response to the French call for help, they began a huge offensive, and did really well until they ran out of supplies and got stuck. Seeing how well the Russians had been doing, Romania decided now would be a great time to jump in and win the war. <sighs> and then they got pounded. The Greeks were fighting amongst themselves about whether to join the war or not. The king liked the Central Powers, while the Prime Minister wanted to join the Allies. After a brief national schism, during which the country split into two, the king finally abdicated and the country reunited. With Allied help, they began a new offensive. In the Middle East, Russia was pushing into Ottoman territory from the north. The British had also made a landing in Mesopotamia to protect Persia's oil fields, and they had also sent a small army up the Tigris River to try to take Baghdad. But the army got sieged in the town of Kut along the way, and eventually surrendered. A new offensive was launched from the south with all-out desert warfare. The offensive was aided by one famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped lead the Arab tribes in a revolt that wreaked havoc on the Ottoman supply lines. By the time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. There were mutinies in the French army, the German populace was starving, and the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. There was no clear winner, and it was still anyone's war. The only question now was, who was going to break first? Good question. And the answer was Russia. Tired of not eating and mad that a crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots, there was an uprising in Petrograd complete with riots and strikes. The riots turned into a full-scale revolution and a new government overthrew the Tsar. Then a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government and they pulled Russia out of the war. This was great news for Germany, who now only had to focus on the Western Front. But there was still one problem. The pesky United States of America was looking increasingly like it was going to join the war. America had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war and was getting super rich off the back of it, meaning it was in fantastic shape and was dangerous to the Germans. So Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be crazy cool if you guys attacked America? But the British uh. intercepted the message, showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. American troops began shipping out oh, to Europe. Oh, I didn't know this that. This was man. terrible news for Germany, and they knew their only hope now was to force France and the UK to surrender before the fresh American troops arrived. It was now or never, so they started one final attack. They converged their troops and hit hard at the Somme and pushed the Allies back. They hit a second time further north, then again and again. With each hit, the Germans were spending more and more resources, while the Allies were getting better and better at repelling their attacks. By the fifth punch, the Allies held the line and even pushed back. With American troops now arriving in larger numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, and that was it. The Central Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire, then Austria-Hungary, and finally on November 11, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. At the peace treaty, Germany was forced to reduce its military, accept war guilt, and pay the bill for the war. After indescribable suffering and millions dead, the world learnt its lesson and never had such an awful war again. Ah, oh, such a shame, that. Right? Yeah, I was going to say, it did. Great watch, yet again, learnt some stuff, and now I know about the trench stuff. That's like... 
Yeah. Oh, no man's land. You wouldn't yeah. even want to think about that, would you? What are you like in that trench no. when you like being told that's you just got to go out in the middle yeah. of nowhere just with barbed wire and disease and... Well, that's it. it was like, yeah, I, I don't know. It was, you know, oh, send 100 men. Okay, they're all dead, right? Send another 100. Oh, they got a bit further. So no, it's just... And like you said there, oh. just trying to gain metres pretty much at best. It's, yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah. So you'd like to think that even if there was a war again, heaven forbid, there'd be nothing like that. I mean, there were, I mean, I don't know, the Air Force back then was literally, by the look of it, non-existent, weren't it? It, was, it wasn't until a, a yeah, later and, day. and really, thank God that Germany tried to fight everybody at the same time because if they'd really put their efforts into just one place at a time. They kind of did that with World War Two, didn't they? Because yeah, they, they got the same mistake. You know, right? Adolf kind of got a little bit greedy. He was going, yeah. oh, we'll go for yeah. that and then we'll go down yeah. there and then we'll go over there all at the same like, time. Russia's like, I don't know how many times bigger than anywhere and yeah, we'll take them on while we're trying to fight that was cle- That was clever on World War Two because they kind of mm. let them come into Russia because they knew that it would get cold and the Germans That's weren't right. prepared yeah, that for that, were they? So yeah. that was quite clever. Uh, let us know what your thoughts are on the oversimplified mm. World War One Part 1 and mm. 2 in the comments below. Other than that, be sure to subscribe to us and join us on the journey of other random reactions, mm. history, geography, space, all that sort of stuff, because we're going to be doing loads more of them. We, we enjoyed them. They uh, it did, yeah. A fascinating watch, really, That's some it. of these programmes. We, we got... started this channel just doing films and games, but history, music... Yeah, music, so yeah, doing much, all sorts. Yeah. Excellent. Lovely. So, yeah, other than that, we'll see you all soon. Catch you on the flip side.